I'd like to welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Kathy Sipple, and I am with 219greenconnect.com. Uh, we are the host of this webinar today, presented by Save the Dunes. And if you're new to GoToMeeting or GoToWebinar, I'd just like to take a moment to familiarize you with how this process will work. Uh, we can accommodate up to 100 people. We've got a fraction of that signed up, and hopefully we'll be having some people uh, sign in soon. If you'd like to ask a question or tell us uh, about yourself, you can do so in the chat window. That chat window is located in your toolbar. For most of you, that will be on the right-hand side. And go ahead and try it out if you can, so I'll know that you know how to utilize this uh, messaging system. You can go ahead and just put in hi or put in your name. If you've got a question already, that would also be great. Uh, you just want to go to the area that says chat and type that in. We will keep all of the audience participants on mute today to preserve the quality of the recording. So hopefully uh, that will be OK with all of you. OK, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to our presenters at Save the Dunes. I think we've got uh, both Nathan and Nicole here. Are you guys uh, ready? I think we're ready to go. OK, go right ahead. And, and I'll be here to moderate with whatever you need. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us on the call. This is Nicole Barker, the Executive Director here at Save the Dunes, and Nathan Pavlovic, who's our Land and Advocacy Specialist. Nathan's been working quite hard on this for, gosh, I'd say over eight months um, at this point. And you know, Save the Dunes first heard that Enbridge was upsizing its pipeline 6B through our region um, last spring when we got a phone call from folks in Michigan um, who are also affected by this pipeline expansion, letting us know that there was a meeting happening the following evening in Laporte, about a half mile from where I live, or about a mile from where I live, and I was unaware of this. And so it kind of blindsided the organization um, a little bit, and when we realized what was happening, we became keen to find out more. And the main reason was that we quickly discovered that there were many, many waterway crossings that this pipeline is going to impact, all of them within 20 miles of Lake Michigan, which is really close when it comes to tar sands pipelines. So Nathan will go into some of the, the additional details about that concern, but suffice it to say that, that our state's particular issues with this project, um, in our particular interest as an organization, have centered on that protection of water quality in Indiana. All right, I'll take it from there. Okay, so um, I think Nicole has covered the basics pretty well. Enbridge Energy um, ha currently has a pipeline that goes through our region. It's a 30-inch pipeline. And what they're proposing is to build a new pipeline parallel to that existing line um, that will be a 36-inch pipeline. Now, that doesn't sound like a big difference, but it actually triples the amount of oil that they're able to move through that pipe. Um, so across the 60 miles of northwest Indiana that this pipeline will um, be constructed across, um, including Lake Porter, LaPorte, and St. Joe counties, um, we'll be seeing a lot more of this material going through. And what we're going to talk about today is a little bit of the background of this project and also um, you know, what those impacts to our region could be. Again, I'm Nathan Pavlovic, and uh, Nicole Barker, Executive Director of Save the Dunes, is, are here to uh, cover this. Um, so I'm going to start off with a, with a brief overview of pipelines generally in the United States to give a bit of background of where is this project coming from, why are we seeing this now, and um, what can we expect in the future. Next, I want to touch on this line in particular and plans for it, then cover some of the concerns, the things that we think are particularly worrisome about this project, and then discuss some opportunities in, for improvement. How can this project um, be safer and better for our communities? So we'll start with some background information. Okay, so what's driving this whole project? What it really comes down to is the fact that we use a lot of energy in this country, and much of it is derived from petroleum. Uh, in fact, 37% of our energy comes from petroleum, and much of that is used for transportation, but also for industrial uses, commercial, and for some electrical power generation. And the issue is we need to get that petroleum from where it comes out of the ground, be it from um, a conventional well or from a the tar sands oil or uh, the tar sands deposits or other sources, and um, we need to get those to the places that we actually want to use those. 
there are a number of ways that those can be transported, either through pipelines, uh, trains, trucks, um, barges, if you um, you know you know large um, tanker vessels, and um, but ultimately the safest way to do that, if we're transporting over land, is through pipelines. Now that doesn't mean that it's perfectly safe. Where does most of our petroleum come from? Well, usually we think of the Middle East, right? So you think of Saudi Arabia, um, maybe you think of Venezuela a little bit. But it turns out that the, major, uh, that the number one country for imports of petroleum to the United States is, in fact, Canada. Um, and Enbridge is one of the largest companies um, bringing oil from Canada to the United States. In fact, if Enbridge were a country, they would be our largest supplier of oil ahead of Canada, Saudi Arabia, Mexico, or any other country. Um, despite its current capacity, though, Enbridge is looking to grow even more. And according to Reuters, we're actually seeing that the U.S. overall is in one of its largest pipeline build-outs ever. That means that we're seeing a vast increase in the amount of pipeline infrastructure across this country. In fact, there's 26 pipeline expansion projects either planned or in progress across the country. Um, and Enbridge's Line 6B is one of them. So let's dive into that a little bit more. Line 6B is part of a larger network of pipelines that are, um, are being utilized to transport tar sands oil from their deposits in Canada down to coasts near Portland, Maine, or the Gulf of Mexico. 6B specifically travel, transports oil between Griffith, Indiana, and uh, Sarnia in Ontario. Um, this new line that we're talking about construction, constructing will run parallel to an existing line. So a few facts about line 6B. So as I mentioned already, the diameter is 36 inches. This is a substantial increase from the 30 inches of the previous pipeline. Um, the old capacity was 240,000 barrels per day. The new capacity will be 800,000 barrels per day. And the total length from Griffith, Indiana to Sarnia, Ontario is 285 miles. Here in Indiana, we have 60 miles of pipeline. And the pipeline itself will cross 82 water bodies, 145 wetlands, and will impact 417 landowners. As you can tell, these are really pretty substantial impacts. And we need to think about you know, how are these impacts being mitigated. Just to visualize that, um, this is the route of the pipeline. Um, you can see there's a, another pipeline that comes in from Illinois on the left of your screen, goes to Griffith, um, and that represents the beginning of Line 6B, travels through Lake County, Porter County, LaPorte County, and St. Joe County on up into Michigan to travel on to Ontario. And what you can see is that the pipeline crosses a number of substantial water, waterways um, here in northwest Indiana. So what are the concerns? Well, you may have heard of this pipeline spill before. Um, the bottom line is that although pipelines can be safe and relatively cheap, they are not without risk. One of the most um, poignant examples of, of this was the Kalamazoo oil spill um, in the Kalamazoo River in 2010. This spill, um, which was the most costly spill in the history of the United States uh, on land, uh, impacted 34 miles of the Kalamazoo River. Um, and two years later, and after spending almost a billion dollars, the spill has not yet been cleaned up. Uh, when the EPA went in to investigate it, they found that over a million ga gallons of oil were spilled into the waterway. And um, the effects of that continue today. What was one of the most shocking statistics was that investigators found that Enbridge allowed this spill to continue for 17 hours, despite the fact that alarms were going off in their control room and that um, Red, local residents were beginning to detect the, you know, the smells, the odors of the spill already. Again, cleanup has been going on for two years, and after almost a billion dollars spent on it, we're st um, still seeing oil contamination in this river. Um, over 
there's about 200 acres of the riverbed that are still um, that still have oil on them. And while the EPA is going to require about 100 acres of that still to be cleaned up, uh, 100 of that will remain on the bottom of the river for perpetuity. Though the river has been declared safe for use, um, there, it's, uh, bathers are still um, potentially going to come in contact with some of that oil. So some of the impacts of that spill um, included fish and other wildlife that were either killed or injured by the spill. Um, unsightly sheen on the on the river, um, and really just a, a significant impact to the biotic community generally. And today, what they do because you know bathers may come in contact with with oil, or um, if you're out kayaking, um, you might come in t contact with some of the oil that remains in the river. They provide wipes so that you can just remove the oil from your body, um, which to us just does not seem like a, a sufficient solution. You can imagine. If this, if a spill were to occur here in Northwest Indiana, and um, oil were actually to enter Lake Michigan, can you imagine if they were providing wipes along the beach of beaches of Lake Michigan? Northwest Indiana really cannot um, afford to have a spill of that of that nature. Now, one of the the um, elements that went into making this spill such a severe uh, spill was the fact that this pipeline uh, at the time of the spill was transporting tar sands oil. Um, and tar sands oil has uh, a number of properties that are particularly harmful to waterways um, and to nearby residents as well. Um, so this tar sand, these tar sands are originally mined in, in Alberta, Canada. And when they come out of the ground, it's actually a solid. It's a mixture of about 85% uh, sand, silt, or clay. Um, 5 to 10 percent oil, and then about 5 percent water. After refining, or well, not refining, but the, processing that to get the oil out of the sand, they then put it, you know, put it into a pipeline, and it's still such a viscous material, it's a tarry substance, they actually have to dilute it with a much lighter um, uh, petroleum product that comes from the um, natural gas refining process. And so what happens is when this oil spills into the environment, those two phases can separate. And so you get um, the lighter, uh, the smaller molecules coming out of that, things like benzene, hydrogen sulfide, um, and other smaller types of oil evaporating into the air, which can cause um, a more or less toxic cloud uh, that can you know, have serious impacts, health impacts on uh, people nearby. A recent study of residents near the Kalamazoo River who were impacted by the spill found that over 300 um, residents in the area suffered negative health impacts as a result of the spill. At the same time, the heavy components of this material are going to travel to the bottom of waterways or become suspended in the middle of the waterways. This is bad not only because it can smother plants and animals that live on the bottom of the river, but it also makes the cleanup astronomically more difficult to conduct. Um, we've, the EPA officials that have been involved in the cleanup have said that it's um, a spill that really is, has been unprecedented, that the people that they have had in the field um, who have responded to other spills of other types of materials really did not have the right methods or experience to clean up this spill. The conventional way to con contain a spill of this sort is to just place booms, floating booms, across the top of the water. Unfortunately, um, that does not contain oil that lies on the bottom of the river or is suspended somewhere in the water column. And so, the uh, initial response after the response began, 17 hours after the, the spill began, was actually um, largely ineffective at containing the spill. So there's a lot of new concerns. One of the things also to be aware of is that this new material is, this material is relatively new to our country. So we've had a lot of, you know, Texas crude coming out of, coming through our pipelines and other lighter forms of oil that simply don't behave in the same way um, as these tar sands. Unfortunately, the regulatory systems and the pipelines themselves, as well as the, the emergency response systems, are largely, re largely remain unchanged. So we have this new material that has um, new properties and new concerns with it, and a regulatory and emergency response system that hasn't yet caught up. Again, uh, just to illustrate some of the health impacts, this is a picture of a health worker or a cleanup worker in the Kalamazoo River. 
um, you can see he's in contact with that oil despite the fact that it contains chemicals um, that can cause respiratory, gastrointestinal, and neurological symptoms um, associated with con uh, acute exposure. Um, and those same materials over a long-term exposure, um, including benzene and um, some of the other polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, have been known to cause cancer. So this is a really serious concern, not only for our environment, but also for the health of the people um, living along these pipelines. So what about here in Indiana? That was Kalamazoo River up in Michigan. Down here in Indiana, we also have um, a number of pipelines and have seen a fair number of pipeline incidents um, since 1986 when records first become available. In fact, 120 incidents have resulted along pipelines, including 66 natural gas incidents and 54 hazardous liquid incidents. Uh, these incidents have caused 11 fatalities, 73 inju injuries, $54.2 million in property damage in Indiana alone, and untold environmental harm. Back in uh, 1988, for instance, in the uh, Calumet River, the Grand Calumet River, there was, a, um, there was an oil spill that actually impacted that and resulted in, in massive fish kills. Now, ironically, that's some of our best data for what fish are actually found in the, Calum uh, in the Grand Calumet River. But, uh, it, you know, this is, these are the sorts of impacts we're seeing. It's really substantial um, harm to our fish, our aquatic life, and, and our environment generally. And the question is, can we improve that? Can we reduce this impact? So our concerns for Northwest Indiana are twofold. First, okay, if a spill happens, are we ready to contain it, and can we prevent a spill from happening in the first place? And, and also, what will the impacts of the, constru the actual construction of this pipeline be, right? So taking 60 miles of the pipeline and putting it in the ground is going to have substantial impacts just on the ground um, the, the, and the ecosystems that lie above it. We can see substantial um, harm to our aquatic resources and, and, and our um, natural areas generally. The picture on the right, you can see that's the spill that happened. That's the crack in the pipeline that caused the Kalamazoo spill. Um, on the top, and then on the bottom, this is another project that Enbridge did um, over in Wisconsin, actually, in 2008-2009. They were putting in a pipeline, and that project actually resulted in over 500 violations of water quality standards um, just during the construction alone. And you, this is just one example. You can see just a massive amount of muddy water running down this hill. And these are the sorts of things that, you know, while, uh, you know, we might see these every day. They really should be prevented. Um, and you know, on the scale of a pipeline, these, if not mitigated, these sorts of impacts can really take a toll on our environment. Um, and going back to the number of river crossings we see in our region along this pipeline, we see some, some serious impacts. The Kalamazoo spill was not a great one. Um, but it was by far, it was far from the only spill that Enbridge has had in the last few years. In fact, since 1999, Enbridge has spilled 6.8 million gallons of oil. So this is not an isolated incident. There have been a number of spills caused by this company over the past number of years. And so we have every reason to question whether this pipeline, is doing, pipeline company is doing everything in its power to prevent these spills and protect the communities that can be impacted by these tragedies. A few other examples of significant incidents that we've seen in the last few years. Um, just in 2012, there was a spill of about 40,000 gallons um, in Illinois. This was um, relatively contained, but again, a large amount of oil coming into the environment. A second spill um, in July of 2012 was about 50,000 gallons of oil that were spilled into a farm field. Um, and some anecdotal reports say that the trees were covered in oil. Um, there were a number of farm animals that were um, hit by this oil. It was really a pretty um, shocking uh, spill. So again, you know, just that was just in 2012. And so this is not a question of if so much as it is a question of what are the probability, what is the probability, and and when.
So coming back to this map of um, the pipeline route through northwest Indiana, you remember I, may, I mentioned that along the Kalamazoo River, there were 34 miles of the river impacted. Here in northwest Indiana, we don't have 34 miles of river to be impacted. Every single one of the river crossings of this pipeline are within 20 miles of Lake Michigan. So if we saw a spill of that magnitude in our region, we would have oil in Lake Michigan. And the impacts would be devastating. Lake Michigan provides all sorts of benefits to our region. Um, the waterborne shipping industry brings in about $14 billion and over 100,000 jobs every year. Commercial and sport fishing alone provides $400 million, million to Indiana. Um, we get over 200 mil, or 2, million, sorry, 2 million visitors to the Indiana Dunes, um, which brings in a vast amount of um, tourism dollars and other benefits to the region. Recreational boating um, brings in about $2 billion. Uh, the lake itself provides drinking water to 6 million people in Chicagoland. And many of our industries rely on this water for their um, continued operations. A spill of oil um, along this pipeline or along any pipeline in our region would um, you have substantial impacts on, on all of these activities. I just imagine... Uh, Sorry, Nicole, this is Nicole interjecting. I think one of the other things that's important to consider is just how many of our facilities, our industries along the lakefront, use Lake Michigan water for cooling and for processed water. And that includes some of the facilities um, like NIPSCO, NISORS, generating our energy. Um, so if they're not able to pull water from the lake to generate our energy, what happens to our power situation in the region? Um, and you know, you think about the steel mills, if they're not able for a period of time to pull that water, um, what does that mean for jobs? What does that mean for the plant being functional or not? And, and along the sim similar lines, I mean, can you imagine trying to replace drinking water for 6 million people? If, if significant contamination got into that water, where would you get that water? So there's really, really concerning statistics here. So what can we do to try to prevent this? What opportunities do we have for improvement? So there's a number of areas uh, that we see that Enbridge can improve on um, through the one way or another to reduce the likelihood of a spill. One way they can do this is by improving their safety standards. So um, are there uh, particular ways that the pipeline can be designed, for instance, um, implementing uh, leak detection systems that are able to detect much smaller uh, levels of, uh, of a spill um, that would be foolproof against the sorts of errors that we saw in the Kalamazoo River? Um, or are there concrete caps, for instance, that could be placed above the pipeline that could reduce the risk that um, construction or other activities could be in the area could uh, accidentally damage the pipeline? These are the sorts of things that the, the industry, the, and Enbridge in particular, should be considering implementing along the pipeline. Um, and these are technologies that have been implemented elsewhere. There was a pipeline in um, Austin that has put in both leak detection systems that can detect as little as three gallons of oil rather than the thousands that it takes for Enbridge to become aware of a spill currently. Um, and that also implemented these concrete caps that could reduce um, imp impacts or damage from construction. That's particularly important for our region because we are such a developed and developing region. Um, almost 40% of the pipeline in our area uh, runs through areas that are either considered already developed or um, at a likelihood to develop in the coming years, according to um, data collected um, by the Northwest Indiana Regional Planning Commission. So we see that there are some really, um, these, these concerns are not, maybe not being met with the same level of technology as are available to the industry. And we're wondering why aren't these um, technologies being implemented? And in fact, asking the company to do just that. Another area, so, so that's the first thing, try to prevent a spill in the first place through um, good engineering and good safety standards. If a spill does occur, though, what we've seen is that 
effective and rapid emergency response is critical to reducing the impacts of the spill. So in the Kalamazoo River, one of the largest um, impacts of the, the size of the, on the size of the spill was the fact that it took the company 17 hours to respond to it. And even once they had responded to it, the company that they had contracted to provide the response was some 10 hours away um, and didn't, couldn't respond immediately. We think the company can do better. Here in Northwest Indiana, even their published um, response time can, is up to three hours long. So once the company becomes aware of an issue, it could take them three hours to actually get to the, um, the, the site of the spill. We think that that is just too long and should be reduced to one hour or less. Similarly, um, going back to, to design and engineering, if there are areas that are particularly environmentally sensitive, why not avoid them in the first place? If a spill occurs, it can't impact that, that area simply because the pipeline doesn't pass through it. There are a number of places that have been identified throughout Northwest Indiana, and including um, one particularly sensitive area north of Hudson Lake in uh, LaPorte County, that if the pipeline were rerouted to go around that area, instead of passing straight through it, the construction impacts would be, be reduced, and also the risk of a spill ever impacting that area would be mitigated. So we think that the company should seriously consider um, routing alternatives, including around Hudson Lake and elsewhere. Finally, we will, um, what we'd like to see are the implementation, um, in partnership with our regulators, of independent environmental monitors. Now, what these, peop these people would do is essentially be out in the field during construction making sure that the kinds of violations that happened up in Wisconsin, um, you remember there were over 500 of those, are not happening here in Northwest Indiana. And if they do happen here, that, that the company is held to account for those. So um, overall, an approach of reducing the risk of a spill, improving the ability of both our local emergency responders and the company itself to, to respond to a spill, and then making sure that the actual construction of this pipeline don't, doesn't impact our environment are all key elements of improving the safety of this pipeline. Now, one of the broader issues here is the fact that in Indiana generally, unlike many of our neighboring states, we don't require any specific permit for pipeline construction. So, the company does need to apply for approval from the Army Corps of Engineers and the Indiana Department of Environmental Management um, for uh, their impacts to wetlands and water bodies, to waters of the, of the United States. But there's no specific pipeline that applies, or permit that applies specifically to a pipeline. As you can see from this map, many of our neighbors, including Illinois, Michigan, Ohio, Minnesota, and New York, all require some sort of permitting process that will provide an opportunity for comprehensive review of a pipeline's plans to ensure that they're both safe, reasonable, and necessary. That's something that we don't have here in Indiana and something that our um, lawmakers should be seriously considering implementing. So what are our specific asks? Well, as I've already covered, we'd like to see concrete caps um, and also high quality domestically produced steel implemented along this pipeline project. We'd also like to see leak detection systems that warn when as little as three gallons of oil are spilled. We'd like to see reduced emergency response times on the part of the company from three hours to one hour or less. We'd like to see the company working with emergency responders in our area to provide the knowledge and the resources that they need in when, a sp when and if a spill occurs in our region. And we'd like to see specific actions um, taken to reduce the impact of construction on the environment. And then finally, a broader goal um, for Indiana generally to help prevent this sort of ad hoc response to massive infrastructure projects of this sort is, an implement, is implementation of legislation that would provide comprehensive vetting of all pipeline projects here in Indiana. So this is your opportunity to help take action. What we need 
Um, this company won't implement these on their own. What we need is um, input from people who are impacted locally and from our decision makers, our um, elected officials, saying that these things are important to the health and safety of our communities and our environment and that they need to be implemented along this pipeline. So what we're asking people to do today is to talk to your elected officials, tell them that you want Enbridge to build a safe pipeline through Northwest Indiana, and tell them that prevent, preventing a spill that reaches Lake Michigan, improving construction practices, and creating regulations for pipelines will make our region safer. Now, what we're going to do uh, after this presentation is we've put together some materials to help you do just that. We have um, a template letter um, for elected officials, a fact sheet outlining exactly what the issues with this pipeline are and why um, these improvements are needed along the pipeline, and then um, a list of the contact information for the elected officials that have districts that are impacted by this pipeline. We hope you'll um, take those and use them um, and send them on to your elected officials in order to to help us make this pipeline safer. It's really, this is uh, so critical to reducing this pipeline. It's been such an ad hoc project. Um, they tried to, when we first learned about it, they were trying to drive it through in a number of months. Luckily that planning process has been, been lengthened and so we are seeing some of the review we need, but it's not yet clear that all the steps that need to be taken are going to be taken before this pipeline gets in the ground. We may have this in the ground in our region for 100 years. Some of these pipelines in our nation today have been in the ground for 100 years. This is our one shot to get this pipeline right, and it's up to you to help us make this happen. So as I said, uh, we'll be emailing you, the, you those materials um, and to help you take this action, and we also encourage you to get involved um, with our organization. Uh, we're Save the Dunes. Um, you can find us at savedunes.org, save and you can also find us on Facebook. There's also a page called Indiana Residents Concerned About Enbridge, and that does a pretty good job of keeping people up to date um, on the latest news around Enbridge and, and other things. So we encourage you to like both Save the Dunes page and Indiana Residents Concerned About Enbridge. Um, Nick, this is Nicole again. One, one last thing, too, is um, a lot of organizations like ours that are, that are small, not-for-profits, you know, have a hard time um, getting funding to help with these types of efforts. Um, as you can imagine, when you're known as the regional advocacy group that, that points out issues that some of these businesses have, um, you can't get grants as easily <laughs> to support your work. So we are really dependent on our um, others who are passionate about this kind of environmental advocacy to help support us. So I do encourage you to become a member. Um, if you're hesitant to do that just yet, why don't you just um, follow us on Facebook and see what we're up to and, um, and get engaged in our work. One last thing that I think is also encouraging on this is we have heard from Enbridge that they do have a tar sand specific online training that they're providing to the um, emergency responders in our region. And when I talked to the staff person there, I said, you know, how many of them are actually taking it and how many have had in-person trainings with you? And she said, well, you know, we don't really know how many are taking them. Um, and so that's we really want to go further, and so in April, we're working to put together a meeting with all four counties in Indiana, all their emergency response teams, with the staff that were there firsthand at the Kalamazoo spill. The, the first response team um, and the on-scene coordinators from the US EPA have agreed to give a presentation to these hazmat folks and us, um, but you know we, we can't have the company there and we can't have um, the media there, so it'll be an interesting process as we learn you know, very specifically what lessons they learned, and is our region really prepared? We have one of the county emergency response teams saying, yeah, we've got it, no problem. And one of the other counties saying, you know what, we don't feel like we have adequate equipment or training. And so we just want to make sure that if people really are fully trained and ready, we'll be really happy. But we would just like a little more reassurance than that. So um, if folks are interested in hearing more about that, again, you know, sign up on our Facebook page. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and I think if we have some questions, that would be, we do. Uh, we'd be more than happy to answer. Yeah, this, this is Kathy Sipple again. Um, so I, I'll go ahead and read them to you, Nathan, unless you're able to access the questions yourself directly. Yeah, why don't you just go ahead and read them out? Okay, a question from Robert. Which entity in Indiana is responsible for overall emergency response coordination? Pipeline Safety Trust? advise that federal law now provides for public access to response plans. What are your plans to take advantage of this access? 
Have you requested drafts of plans for the new 6B? Have you discussed access with PHMSA? Um, yeah, so I've been in touch. Um, well, so that's it's a bit of a sticky issue um, getting access to those documents. I know that uh, the Pipeline Safety Trust, um, I believe, has had some difficulty in um, getting those uh, that new law actually implemented. Um, so getting access to those has been difficult. Um, and we, we haven't actually been able to see those emergency response plans as of yet. Um, there was um, a map floating around that showed the, um, the sort of the response radiuses. So how long is it going to take uh, these uh, you know, re responders, this company, to respond to a sp particular spill? And um, what you can see from that is that it's just uh, it's going to take three hours in many places here in Indiana and um, elsewhere. It takes up to I think five hours to respond to, to spills, and so that's really kind of concerning. Um, in terms of uh, our emergency responders, you know, it's really going to be the local the local folks that uh, take the first action, right? So it's going to be our county or potentially even local fire departments that are responding. Um, when a, an emergency first gets called in or reported, and at least in a lot of cases, um, there was the new. There was a recent report that showed that um, the vast majority of, of spills are actually detected by people on the ground, either nearby residents or um, the you know pipeline employees who are out on the the, uh, the line. So um, you know those are the those are the folks who are going to be. Uh, taking, you know, being there on the ground trying to respond to these bills. And we think that that's, like, that's where the focus really needs to be. These people need to, to understand what the risks are, that there is, in fact, a risk, and that it's not, uh, um, and that it's a risk of a nature that maybe they have not experienced before or that emergency responders across the country have not experienced before. Um, so I think communication there is really important. I would add to that that um, when we asked, we had a public meeting uh, months ago with Enbridge, and when, when various folks in the audience prompted them, asking them what their specific responses were, and had they had response plans that really consider the specific hydrodynamics of our waterways, the geomorphology, the, the stream, uh, you know, substrate, flow rates, um, contours, and so forth, and they didn't really answer the question clearly. We, since then, offered to have various regionally, you know, high-level scientists work with them to do some modeling about how a spill might behave in each of our major waterways here. And to date, you know, they said they're thinking about it, but they have not committed to do that with us. And we think that would be a really neat and innovative way that they could work with the local community to get everybody better prepared. Good. Well, that was a long question and a very good answer. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, it required a, you know, lengthy explanation. So thank you. That was well done. And we have a second question from Beth. She asks, do you know which locations in Indiana are considered HCA versus USA? HCA meaning high consequence area, and USA meaning unusually sensitive area. Uh, so we haven't been able to um, get the official delineations on that. Um, based on the Indiana, the urban areas identified by the 2010 survey, um, census, there, a, there should be a large number of, or a pretty big area of HCA, especially in Lake County, but also some in, um, in Porter County. Um, now, you know, again, how the company is approaching those, um, we're not sure, but at least in um, Lake County, there's, there's quite a bit of, of what's considered developed urban urban area. I would say too that they, from what I recall, correct me if I'm wrong, Nathan, they have cited homeland security issues with not wanting to share some of those things. I'm not quite clear on that. But in our opinion, either way, we think that we and others working in the Great Lakes region in particular think that the whole Great Lakes area should be considered a high consequence area, right. considering we're getting our drinking water from it. So other important organizations like National Wildlife Federation and others on a more regional level are considering that too. Right, and and I think to the company's credit, potentially, um, they have committed to treat the whole, the entire Line 6B as a high consequence area, which comes with, you know, a suite of maintenance um, plans and other 
um, actions that, that will improve the safety of the pipeline in theory. I think going back to um, one of the, the mantras of, of safety organizations, generally though, this idea that, and this comes from the Pipeline Safety Trust in particular, is that you trust but verify, right? So this company, you know, Enbridge is saying they're going to treat it. Let's make sure that they actually do treat it as a high consequence area and um, implement everything that they have that they have available to make sure that these resources are protected. And Beth did follow up with a, a clarification. She said that the reason that she asked is because Enbridge inspects lines based on, I think, that, that classification of whether or not the line passes through those areas. Right. And I believe they've said that they will inspect, they'll use those inspections or implement those inspections along the entire pipeline. Um, but if, they, if that were to lapse, I don't know that there's any um, legal reason there would be any legal recourse to, to hold them to that. So, and Michael, that Michael has added not so much a question, but just a comment uh, saying how important the Hudson Lake area is in LaPorte County that you had mentioned before. Nathan saying that you know he would like to see that considered an HCA area. Uh, okay, so let's see. We've got a couple more questions. Um, we've got a question from Jeffrey, and Jeffrey asks, now that the Michigan Public Service Commission has approved the phase of the project that includes the Indiana stretch, Enbridge surely thinks they've got a green light. And in our experience, municipal officials tend to believe what they are told by Enbridge. What kind of regulatory leverage do you have in Indiana to get them to take seriously the conditions you're interested in? So, um, as I as I mentioned before, we don't have a we don't have the equivalent of the um, Michigan Public Service Commission, um, so we don't have that sort of stamp of approval. What we do have are the, the Clean Water Act review, which is um, the 401 requirements um, that are implemented by the Indiana Department of Environmental Management, and so they're currently reviewing um, this. Uh, this permit that Enbridge has applied for, we were able to um, secure a hearing, a public hearing that was had some really impressive attendance, um, I thought, on this pipeline um, that was held in December of last year. And um, yeah, so so there's there's some opportunity there. We've asked for um, what we feel is within the scope of that regulatory process from IDEM, and we've asked them to include things like independent environmental monitors um, and and other measures that should improve the, the safety of this pipeline. Um, so, th so there's that, and that's essentially it. <laughs> well, we, we're awaiting their final decision, and Enbridge has come on record saying that if IDEM requires it, they will implement independent environmental monitors. Mm -hmm. The word we're hearing from IDEM is that they don't see that per the way that we implement 401 water quality certification in Indiana, that they can do that. So we, are, we continue to push on IDEM, and IDEM has made comments to Enbridge that have been um, pretty inclusive a lot of a lot of the same concerns that we share here. So that was really encouraging. Um, we also tried to get the Army Corps of Engineers to review this under an individual permit, which would involve more scrutiny and public input rather than a nationwide permit, and they have declined to do that. Um, and that's unfortunate. And um, the only thing outstanding in my mind is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has a Indiana bat, which is a listed species. Um, they are not sure that adequate um, surveys in the field have been conducted to date. So it remains to be seen how that will impact the both the IDEM report and the Army Corps of Engineers report, but they have taken a very strong and protective stance during this project. We're very proud of them as, as a local agency. Great. I'm, I'm not sure if this, uh, you guys obviously know way more about this than I do, but I'm trying to moderate the chat. Michael had an additional comment, I believe, on the same topic. He says, LaPorte County Ordinance 2012.02 could offer regulatory leverage uh, since the line 6B phase 2 pipeline is new development. He's got that in quotes per Mitch Bishop Laporte County Planner. So I'm not sure if, if that fits or not, but I'll definitely make these notes available to, you know, to our presenters. Uh, there were, I don't know if you guys want to say anything else about that or if I should go to the next question. Just I uh, would agree that it does seem that there um, there are building ordinances. If you were to, say, decide to build a driveway, you'd be required to apply for a building permit. Enbridge has, to date, not applied for those sorts of building permits. So uh, that's a question 
We are working with Michael, who's, who was the one um, making the question for La Porte County specifically on this matter. And we understand that Porter County has a similar um, law. So we, we are going to be trying to work with all three counties in the next week or so to make sure they also understand that, they, that we're watching them on this matter on that county level. Great. Great. We've got a couple questions from Jake, too. Um, I guess the first one's really more of a comment, but he says he's Jake from Michigan, and he's organizing an action camp this spring in Kalamazoo with trainers from Tar Sands Blockade, and they're out of Texas. So if anybody's interested in attending that, he's offered up his email, which I, I guess I have the okay to say on air. It's Jake mcg83 at gmail.com, and so he's just asking people to email them if you'd like information about that action camp. Uh, he also asks, is climate change of concern with tar sands oil specifically? What scientists have said, um, to my understanding, is that if, that, um, if tar sands reserves in Canada are exploited to their fullest extent, um, the quote is that it, that's game over for the climate, that essentially uh, the commitment that our federal government and other governments um, around the world have made to keep um, CO2 emissions at a level that will keep our the temperature increase caused by climate change below 2 degrees Celsius um, would essentially be impossible to meet at that point. Um, not to depress everybody, right. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not good for climate change. Yeah, and John had a, a question about uh, climate change as well. That was a concern he had. And I think I know this from listening to you before, but he's also asked the question, what chance is there to deny the pipeline altogether? I mean, it's it's already there, basically, right? It's just... Yeah, the pipeline be... already exists. And one of, one of the important notes that we've been stating all along is that, cause, because we got some pushback in the media, like, hey, the pipeline has major defects and flaws, and, and it needs to be replaced. It's almost dangerous. And we've always said so far that um, we agree that the existing pipe needs to be replaced. Um, we, VP here, just upgraded their facility to the tune of $4 billion to process tar sands, and that happened prior to Nathan and me being here in the region. Um, and so uh, our organization has not come out saying we need to stop the pipeline entirely because it is posing a risk to the region right now in the state that it's in. Um, we also don't think, politically speaking, in our state that it's realistic that necessarily they could, that we could stop that effort, um, however we may feel personally in our, in our personal lives. So, uh, you know, the pipeline, another caveat is that we feel very strongly, you know, we have kind of delayed Enbridge on this project because of all this increased scrutiny that we've been pushing for with the regulators. So it slowed them down significantly. They had an anticipated finishing by the end of last year, and now they're saying maybe June, um, in part due to our issues and comments and the regulatory agencies responding how they have. So what we've been saying in the media is that doesn't mean that because there's a delay that you shouldn't keep, you know, the highest level of scrutiny on the pipeline in, in case there's, it's being replaced because there are a lot of issues and because they want to increase the flow, of course, through the region. But that doesn't excuse them from making sure that everything is very safe until they actually get the permits to put the thing in the ground. Right. And what we've been hearing is that they may have been deferring some of their maintenance activity because they're expecting to replace this pipeline. Um, so that there are some areas maybe where there are concerns on the existing pipeline that they've chosen not to address, and we think that that is um, absolutely wrong. As long as there's material flowing through it, if they're not 100% sure it's safe, that is an issue. And I mean, I, those, those are comments that people have made to us. We don't, we don't have any verification that that's actually happening, but um, you know, we, we keep encouraging Enbridge to make sure it isn't happening. Yeah, yeah. So. Great. Um, Let's see, Alicia has asked if I can repeat Jake's email, so I'm thinking if she wants it, maybe somebody else is also interested. Jake, again, was the one who said he was planning the action camp, and that email is Jake, M-C, Mike, that's M like Michael, C like Charlie, G like uh, Gail, 83 at gmail.com. And then uh, I love this, that a couple of people are all asking uh, to connect with one another, um, Jeffrey has asked if, if we can put him in touch with Michael. Michael, if you could indicate in chat if that's okay to give your information out. I don't want to do that unless people have requested. Uh, but it sounds like you guys have a conversation uh, that and Jeffrey is saying that he can be found at the Line 6B Citizens blog. Jeffrey, do you want to give us the, 
the URL for that? Is, can you give us the www? Okay, and Michael is indicating that it's fine to uh, connect with him. His phone number is 574-654-8935, and his email is mfholcraft, that's H-O-L-L-C-R-A-F-T, at yahoo.com. So thanks for stepping up and allowing yourselves to be part of the connection. It obviously helps you know, keep the conversation going. Just a reminder, we will make this video available to attendees afterwards, so if, if you think somebody else needs to be part of this conversation, you will have the opportunity to share this whole thing in its entirety or to go back and listen to part of it yourself if you need a refresher. There's a lot of technical information if this isn't what you do every day. Uh, Jeffrey has shared his, his blog site, and that is uh, grangehallpress.com forward slash Enbridge blog. So uh, we've got some information there. I think those are all of the questions. Uh, Nathan or Nicole, would you like to add anything else? Well, uh, thank you to, to you, Kathy, and to 219 Green Connect for hosting this webinar today. Um, we really appreciate you doing that. And Thanks that for everybody for taking out. the time, too, to, to join us. Uh, don't yeah, forget well, to find both Save the Dunes on, on Facebook and Indiana Residents Concerned About Enbridge on Facebook. And I, I guess I will just give a shout out to if everybody you know who's on the call may not be on Facebook, we certainly would love you to follow us on uh, Facebook with 219 Green Connect as well. We do have just a regular site, so you don't have to be on Facebook to you know follow and join and listen to the podcast and other you know videos that we do. So that is just simply 219greenconnect.com. All right, I think that's about every everything. Michael just said great presentation, so thanks very much to our wonderful presenters. I heard you guys, you know, discuss this a couple times and just felt it was very necessary to put it out there in a way that, you know, could be shared. So uh, another kudos coming in from Jeffrey. Great job, Nate and Nicole. So thank you once again, everybody. Thanks. And we'll go ahead and uh, process the recording. It should be available to you within uh, no longer than 24 hours. Okay. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you.